Okay, so everyone, welcome to our Evergreen Virtual Travel Experience. And we're so glad you can be here tonight. Um, so we're gonna, we have two things for the program. Um, and the first one uh, is uh, Jack actually took a trip last week and stayed with Evergreen members so we can talk about that, the travel aspect as well as his destination, which was Mesa Verde National Park in Southern Colorado. And um, he has some great pictures and learned some really fascinating history. So it's gonna be interesting. Um, and then the second update, you, oh gosh, how many months ago was it now, where we shared our, our raised bed self-irrigating garden that Jack built. And we, we have a new addition to the garden and thought we would share that with everyone. So Jack, if you want to go ahead and share your screen. Um, so everybody just kind of mute yourself. And then if you have questions, you can either chat them or you can hold them till the end. And if we need to go back to a picture, Jack could do that as well. So, um, oh, that's perfect. Jack takes up the whole screen. Okay, good, good. Um, I, you know, I, I just want to let everyone know, you know, I'm traveling again. <laughs> so, you know, the, and, and some of it is um, being very careful, spending a lot of time outdoors, but we also have many evergreeners who are opening up their homes and you can tell that if you go to their profile and they've selected a green check as opposed to a red X ne next to their name. I realize some of that is run by the different states, which don't allow certain other states in or whatever, but New Mexico does allow Texas in. And uh, the Evergreeners were just wonderful there. Um, interestingly, about the archeology span in the title of this, I mean, if you think about what is archeology, span it's like finding stuff that people have left and drawing conclusions from that. And the only two things you need to know about archaeology, the only two things, are that you have to have a mystery to solve and you have to have a very cool fedora like Indiana Jones to wear. You got that, you got it all. That's the hard part. And where I traveled was, um, I, I live in Dallas and I traveled over near the Four Corners region where Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona come together. And this is a, a very interesting place because it has the greatest collection of cliff dwellings of any place really on earth. But um, it, it, I, I think you'll enjoy seeing some of it and try to solve some mysteries about what, what we're looking at here. Um, the, the, this, this area over here is where the four corners are. And right about an hour from that is Farmington, New Mexico. And there's three Evergreeners right in this area. And if you've never been to Farmington, New Mexico, what a little gem. I mean, it was a beautiful, cool little place. And some of the people that retire there, you know, have probably looked all across the country and said, where's the place that's affordable, it's beautiful, it has great climate, and, and you're near interesting things. And that's what, the, and this is what that stone looks like more in the in its natural environment. But um, beautiful place to go, very neat nighttime activities. I mean, just to, you're in some of the darkest areas in the whole in the whole of North America, and because of that, the stars are just brilliant and just beautiful and almost overwhelming, you know, where it, it isn't a question of finding the Milky Way. It's like, well, there's the Milky Way right in the middle of it, you know, and, and you can easily pick out the constellations and see the, and, and distinguish between stars and planets just by looking up. So I mean, beautiful, beautiful place to go. The, um, and about, I think it was 48 miles from their house, if you go due north, is Mesa Verde National Park. 
and um, Mesa table, Verde green, um, you know, you, you would have a, a um, this area that the climate has changed over time. And this area was occupied by the Anastasi um, Indians back around the year 500. And very interesting because they did not write down things. It wasn't like the Egyptians, you wrote down stuff. They had only an oral tradition. And so anything we know about them is kind of a mystery. We don't really know for certain, you know, what they were like or what they did, but it was it was so interesting to see and, and get to know. And from that area, there are a lot of different tribes. And some of these you might have heard of, the Hopi, the, the Ute, um, the Zuni, um, you know, uh, the Navajo in this area. And so there, there are different, you know, different tribes that, that were predated by the Anastasi. And so um, don't, don't mind my virtual background. Those, those are uh, golfers walking around back there, my virtual background. Um, but in this area, just to put it in context, if you looked at ancient Egypt when the pyramids were built, which was 2900 BC, so you know almost 5,000 years ago, and then the Parthenon at 450 BC, the Roman Colosseum at the year one was the opening date there, and in even in, in Constantinople, the um, Hagia Sophia built in 500, in the year 500. And look how advanced that is. Domes and structures and this and that. Well, this is what we were doing over here in America at that time. You know, we were like, oh, we, we, weren't, we weren't so advanced. Well, no, we weren't, you know. Um, in fact, you, you have to kind of wonder about what was going on here that a tribe decided that they're going to build into the cliffs, into an area that's easily protected. Um, and, you know, but very unusual, like, you know, you know, what's going on here, the thinking, but this is what you see when you go there. And a lot of this was like, you could sit across and look with binoculars and see into it, but notice there's no arches. There's no Roman arch. The windows are small, you know, it's, it's kind of dark. Well, maybe they wanted that from the shade or whatever, you know, that you, you would get from that, a cooler place. But in this region, there were no springs of water. All of the water they collected was from rainfall. And so they were very adept at collecting that into cisterns and that sort of thing just to survive. And what we found is that the earliest groups of them that came here around five or 600 AD I mean, this is after all those big buildings in Europe have been built. They were still hunter-gatherers. And the only records we have really are showing, here's the hunter with the bow and arrow, and here's the, here's the deer, you know, and they're hunting them. And that type of, you know, communication that we had. And these are called petroglyphs, and they are, you find them along the way as you hike through this area. And something happened called climate change in the year 900 it started raining. It started raining and it changed everything for being, you know, where you're <clears throat> barely scraping by hunting little animals and whatever to being able to grow crops. And they grew a very balanced diet of corn, squash, and beans. And if you eat that diet, you're getting the adequate proteins and carbohydrates to, to be healthy. And so that you see that change, what climate change did for their area took a relatively dry area, started raining, and they adapted to the better. They adapted to the better. You know, it did something interesting. So in, in an archeological standpoint, you're looking for these evidences. And there were some evidences of like tree rings that we now can you know, date based on the thickness of the rings that you would have in there and see when these things occur. But it really changed things for them. And at, they, they did then continue to build, and they built these cliff dwellings. And you had up to 8,000 people living in this town here. Very, very um, 
compact, very vertical. You know, you got the sense, man, everybody must have been really fit, you know, to be able to climb up these cliffs and stuff like that. But that's what they were doing. And they lived here. See the little ladder that's right there? You know, you get from one level to the next level. Well, you also had some areas that were like trading post type areas. And these would have, this would have been stucco on the outside, mud, that's all worn away. But you had these, and there were this area here, this trading post or the first shopping mall, the first shopping mall had, you know, like 300 different rooms in or stores in there. And people would come and they'd trade and stuff. And so, you know, there were a lot of people passing through this region. But look how hard this region is. I mean, this is some tough land. This is, you know, and I went on a couple of hikes up in here, one a, a seven mile, the other a 10 mile. And, you know, it was challenging. And to think about living in that. And you could see some of these areas where you go through. This was the Petroglyph Trail, where you'd go through these little things that were very, you know, very uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. You know, you've got this big rock over top of this little narrow passageway. And you work your way up through this one, and you work your way down through this one. And it was just a real interesting thing. And, and that trail wasn't that long. It was 2.4 miles. But it was interesting because you're getting to see these, these petroglyphs, these, you know, these um, artwork <laughs> on the walls that were telling a story about the people, what they were doing. And now here's how you get around in there. So where shoes that have good grip on them. <laughs> My advice if you go there, uh, because in here, you know, you don't want to be on cowboy boots on these things. You want to be like, you know, something that you can grab a hold of, but you see they're pretty substantial. The ladders and here's, here's uh, you know, somebody going up and you see the group. Here's one, you go up this level and then you go up another level and you're going into these spaces. And, you know, this is all, you know, a way that you could go through. And this, of course, these are now just the tourists going through. I mean, like us, you know, that we're going through. The real um, archaeologists have been through for qu quite a few years before, but not that long. This whole area wasn't discovered until 1880. And so you think about that, that's only 140 years ago. And... You know, to, to think that we didn't even know about this until that time. And when they, in, um, in 1906, um, Teddy Roosevelt made it a national park because it was just such an unusual find. It was just such a, a, a you know, a delightful, strange thing to, to have found out here. Some of this, if anyone's been to Egypt before, you see some of these and they look kind of the same, the ritual chambers in here, where there were some, you know, um, some ritual ceremonies that would go on, and you had a very um, spiritually oriented, very religious uh, society that was there. And many of these, you know, le led you to, um, you know, to, to wonder, well, what was the purpose of that? Well, some of it was the same thing as you would find like in ancient Egypt. The purpose of rituals was to keep the rain gods happy or the weather gods or whatever. But basically, the things that you did not understand, that was you made ritual things to, to the gods. And that's what they were doing in these. And so it was very important, very, very important in a place like this, if you wanted to have rain and farming and everything else, you know, you needed, you needed to, to have your, whoever the head person was for the whole tribe there, they better be doing their job. And just like the Pharaoh and, you know, in the, in, in the year like 2700 BC, where they had a drought in Egypt and they stopped building the pyramids. This is the same sort of thing here, you know, where you, you had a, a time when, the, when, um, uh, you know, if the rain stopped, they blamed it on whoever was in charge. And well, going yeah. back to the ritual chamber, uh -huh. was that um, um, there in the cliffs? Yes, it was. Okay. Yeah. So, so some of these you'd find in places, and um, they also had some other 
assorted areas. There's a place about three hours south of there called Chaco Canyon, which is another center for this sort of thing. And then there was one very close to Farmington called Aztec, and um, it had some of this sort of thing. And these would be in these, they look kind of like pits. They're called Kiva, K-I-V-A. And the Kiva would be down and they would have these places to do ceremonies. And you'll see some of them in, I don't know if, if we have like, see the round thing, this round thing there, that would have been a Kiva. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so, um, you know, uh, I went on some hikes around here just to put it in perspective. That's a person. There's some people. You can see it pretty, everything is very vast, very expansive and bring binoculars. You know, if you want to see into these places that, that it was kind of important, but um, very, very rough country, very, very tough area. Um, little desert animals that you come across, the little lizards and the scorpions and unusual falcons and of course road runners, which you see all over the place. But fun if you're a birder, fun if you're, you know, if you're into that and seeing different things, lots of deer in the national park, lots of bears, but they didn't bother you or anything. So, um, and one of the things that I thought was so fun is to look at when you go to a national park, where do the people sleep? And sure enough, here's the guy with the 30 foot RV. It was very nice, very nice. And then near him was the school bus that somebody had renovated and fixed up and painted up. And then this cool combination of here's a, here's a vehicle with a tent set up on top of the rack so that it was a way to stay off the ground. And just because I was out there by myself, this is where I slept in the sleeping bag on the ground. And, uh, but one of the things it was, it, I did this intentionally because the stars were so beautiful. It was just such a beautiful, beautiful place to, to watch you know, the astronomy and, and enjoy that aspect of it. So kind of fun. Nobody, nobody, you know, no bears bothered me or anything like that in the night. And so what happened to the Anastasi? You know, you don't hear about him anymore. It was, again, climate change. You're getting to that climate's change. <laughs> and so... In 900, it started raining and they switched to farming. And then in 1275, you had something over in Europe that we have documented. It's called the Little Ice Age, the Little Ice Age, where temperatures dropped like 13 degrees across the whole continent. And in the Four Corners region of, of the United States now, um, it stopped raining. Well, what happens when the, you know, when you really are counting on that rain and it stops, they look for somebody to blame. And so guess what? In the walled up rooms, they would find the, who they think was the leader. And also it's interesting, this might've been a society where the women were in charge. The women ran the government of, of the, the city there. And they sent the men out to go collect, you know, food and stuff. And they had a place where they found one of the women leaders staked out and they walled up the room. No, no doors, no windows, no nothing. Just left her in there. And so the, the conclusion from the people that are kind of in the know, and here's the mystery, what happened? Well, the, the drought did happen. They know that. And what also happened is that the, the inhabitants probably got mad at their leader because he or she was not propitiating the gods, not doing her job. You know, her job is to make sure that it rains on schedule or whatever and, and wasn't doing it. And so this is one of the prevalent theories on what, what might have happened there, but the evidence of the drought happening about that time and the departure of the people might have been, you know, it, it probably is the, the leading theory on that, but very interesting. The other thing that they might have had is, we don't know if somebody could have been called a witch, but they might have taken it out on her or whatever, but it, but it was interesting to see that, that they, 
they were not they were not really the type that did human sacrifices as far as we know but they were the type that could get mad at their leaders and <laughs> especially if they didn't understand what was going on how come it's not raining you know kind of thing and so think about that in terms of today's world you know how we get mad at, at somebody blame it on them for something that you know they probably didn't have much to do with but there you go you know so um one of the things that happened though because they did not find eight thousand dead anastasi they found almost nobody well what happened to them the same thing that would happen to us if you lived in a seacoast community and the and the you know the the, you know, the ocean levels rose you'd move you wouldn't sit there and die you'd move inland or whatever well if that's what they did so here's May severity up at this point. And about that time, 1275, they migrated to Arizona, the Hopi, the Apache. They migrated down into New Mexico, the Zuni, and more, more Apache. And they, and they migrated over here to Texas, which would have been the, the Kiowa and some other tribes. And so you have all these people leaving this one condensed area and mixing with other tribes and moving. So, you know, so think about that. Was this climate event a bad thing? Not necessarily because it led to the populating of three states in the US. And so, you know, they, there was, this is what the air is kind of like today. It's not real hospitable. It's not real livable. And yet the people were wise enough to say, okay, things are wrong here, I'm gonna leave. And they did, and they moved to other places. And so those other tribes are still in existence. And, and every one of those tribes can trace their DNA back to the Anastasi, except the Navajo. The Navajo somehow stayed separate, but the Hopi, the Utes, the, the, you know, the, the Apache, these other ones do trace back to the Anastasi. And um, it was, you know, to me, the mystery of, you know, figuring out what happened there was, you know, was part of the fun. And um, if you get a chance to go out there, the Evergreeners were just super hospitable, just wonderful people and really welcoming. And um, again, their area is not, you know, not um, threatened by the pandemic. And um, you, you just see some beautiful things, the beautiful bronze art, the beautiful skies and this is in Santa Fe, the three dancing sheep, which are pretty wonderful too. So um, thank you. I'd be happy to take uh, questions if there are any about, about what, what we saw here. Well, thank I you. actually have a question. Oh, does somebody else? Yeah, I, I was just going to ask um, Jack, uh, did you take all these pictures? Um, absolutely not. Oh. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I took that picture. I, I take a lot of the pictures. I did not take any of these. Uh, yes, no, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so um, okay, no, I, yeah. I, I, I just go and get them if I great, need them. It was a great presentation. Very nice, very nice presentation. I, I Thank really you. enjoyed it. And how did you find um, out there while you were traveling compliance with distant, social distancing and mask wearing? Well, you know, some of it was this, they, they're big believers in vitamin D, lots of sunshine, you know, and, and how that is, is a, and it, it cleans things, you know, that are outside. I mean, you know, like we had somebody mentioned that when they go shopping to a grocery store, they only pick up grocery carts that are ones outside in the sunshine. Then they use those, you know, because it's sanitary. Um, I found everybody but one guy um, who was, he was all panicky and, oh, get away from me kind of thing. Everybody else was fine. Everybody else was great. In fact, the Evergreeners were like, they were, they were so ready to have this thing over with. They were, come on in. Yeah. <laughs> you're eating dinner with us tonight, whether you know it or not. And, and you're having breakfast. So, um, the people were, were pretty good. I didn't, I, you know, again, I think it's wise to check and I think it's, you, you go by whatever the host says but you know in this case the host was like i said do i need a mask and they said, no it's like okay so um you know it and and again almost the entire trip 
was out doors, except for that one night of stay. So um, I felt pretty good about it. And, uh, you know. What were the temperatures while you were there? The, that, I'm so glad you asked, Diane, because the um, at, at night, when I'm in my sleeping bag, it got into the 30s. Got into the, because you're at a high elevation. I mean, you're over a mile, of, I mean, mile and a half above sea level. And um, so it got cold at night, but during the day, it was just beautiful. I mean, it was, it was probably 75 degrees and not a cloud in the sky. It's just bright sunshine, beautiful. Um, I loved it. I was like, this is the perfect time of year to go. And I've got a good quality sleeping bag. So I didn't mind the 30 degrees at night, but it was in the high 30s. It wasn't low 30s. Yes? Um, we've had a couple of um, write-ins. One, Connie and John Robinson said that uh, they were up at 11,000 feet in Creed, Colorado, said felt like they could touch the stars. And then they said that they went to Durango and visited Mesa Verde National Park. The rangers told us that they had discovered uh, hundreds of cliff dwelling sites but left around 500 sites alone until more scientific knowledge allowed them to date and study the culture of the Anastasi. We stayed at the park for at least eight hours. It was a wonderful experience. Uh, you, um, it, it, it's uh, a very... Want to no. say anything else about that? You can unmute yourself. Just push push the space bar. Um, it was a very neat park, and the, I I, uh, I was texting a friend of mine who he and I bike ride together, and it would be a great park to go and like park your vehicle at, at the you know your car at the at the campground, but then take bicycles and ride these trails where you get, ride to each of the overlooks and stuff. Um, the other thing was really fun to hike there. I mean, it was you're up at the higher elevations. Um, and the one thing, there's no water, so you have to bring your own water, but it was just breathtaking. I mean, beautiful scenes everywhere you looked and just a really neat experience. The other thing you're bringing up about the cliff sites that are, they know where they are, but they're not going there yet. There's a technology in um, its radar that you do by satellite or by drone that allows you to see what's below the surface. And like 16 feet below the Sahara Desert in Africa, they found river systems, all types of rivers and towns and stuff. Well, the same thing out in these areas where, the, you know, it's dry and dusty. Things get buried under the sand. And they're using this, what is called LIDAR, L-I-D-A-R. And, it, and it, it's a ranging software that that allows you to penetrate below surfaces. Um, they also use that inside of caves. And our son got to do that with somebody uh, doing a, a cave in Alabama where they set up and did projections. It's a laser range finder type of thing that allows you to map the inside of these chambers and stuff without, you know, without going in and disturbing anything. So archaeology is going to be booming in the next few years because of these technological changes that, that you have. And they're finding sites all over the place, like under the canopy of trees in the Amazon or in, in the Yucatan Peninsula and places where they just haven't been. I mean, it's like it's too dense, but they can see it from the satellite. So what you had mentioned something about the different roads 40 feet wide. What is that here? That was from down here. So I was here in Colorado about the edge of that red circle. If you went to the red circle down here in New Mexico, not that far away, is, um, is another site that is probably bigger in terms of number of, of units that are there, uh, but it's horizontal. It's not vertical like in the, into the cliffs. So it's probably not as cool to see, but... Um, it, it has stemming from this place about right there at the end of my pointer, 
are roads that are 40 feet wide that go off in different directions from there and make this like the, the cultural center or the, the, the central point for all these different tribes. The interesting thing is they did not have wheels. What do you need a road 40 feet wide for if you don't have even carts? There's the mystery to be solved. So what if you could be the one solving that one? I don't, I don't know. I mean, why would you do that? You know, but that's what they had. They, they built these things, you know, like 100 miles out from this in all these directions. And it doesn't seem to have served a transportation purpose, but who knows what the other purposes might be. They use sleds. Um, they they would pull, you know, they would pull, uh, yeah. On, I mean, you know, they would they would have the sticks and sleds and sort of things like that. They would do, but again, I don't know enough about what what the people were like. They certainly did not leave evidence of it. We did, have not come across a wagon wheel out there in in any of these areas. So, um, you know, that in New Mexico is called Chaco Canyon. I want to look that up. Um, the Connie and John also yeah. said that the, the ranger, when they were in Mesa Verde, the ranger also said they did not bury their dead. They tossed them over the side of the cliff edges yeah. near those buildings. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and yeah. But you would still have, you know, if they hadn't migrated, you would have found a pile of that's oh, right. You would have found <laughs> lots, oh. lots and lots of them if something had actually gone wrong. What happened is I think the drought was gradual enough that families, parts of the units started saying, you know what, we're, we're, we're going someplace nice with a lot of rain like New Mexico. <laughs> you know, today we wouldn't say that. So, you know, I mean, you see what, what this whole thing of these natural, naturally occur, occurring climate changes. Uh, not only did we have this little ice age in 1275, but in 1430, you had a heat wave. You had global warming. And it wasn't caused by fossil fuels. I mean, it was, you know, it was, but they were, they were growing grapes. The things that you would grow in Southern Spain and Southern France, they were growing in Norway and Sweden. So, you know, climates change. It's a question of what we do with it, how we adapt to it that matters. So, Here's another, um, when Connie and John were taking this trip, they said that while they were in Durango, they suggest you take the day stream, the day steam driven narrow gauge train up to Silverton, where you visit for a few hours then the train takes you back to Durango. Beautiful vistas all along the train ride through the mountains, like stepping back in time. Well, I um, would love to go back. I drove through Durango and I drove through Pagosa Springs, you know, some of these areas back in there that I would love to go back to and uh, maybe take my fly rod and catch some fish in there too. You know, it was, it was just really pretty. And uh, so, We'll have to have another trip to Durango, or, or maybe if if uh, our Annapolis friends want to do one on uh, on their trip, I, I think that would be a lot of fun. I, you know, this are beautiful places in Colorado. So. Um, and then we had from David and Anne in California. It says Jack, where was the agricultural area in relationship to the cliff dwellings? It's it's How hard. Far did the they didn't have to go hardly anywhere. That was astounding to me is these cliff sides would come down and there'd be a flat area right in the bottom. And it was like, oh, that's where you'd grow everything. I mean, it was very, very neat to, to see um, like, like here, here'd be a cliff side. Again, this would have been from uh, a fictionalized picture, but here's the corn growing. You have cliffside and this flat area down at the bottom. It looks like you want to drive a herd of buffalo through there. I mean, it was just, it was even, flat, and perfect for agriculture. Just perfect for it. So, um, you know, it, it wasn't all jagged and edgy back then. 
back in 900, it was probably a pretty hospitable place. So yeah, he went on to say, did the rains create rivers in the area of the cliff dwellings such that they could use those rivers for irrigation or transportation? You know, the, it's, it's funny because you got, you had evidence that they developed cisterns or ways to collect water, but I don't think it was actually forming lakes or, or reservoirs or things like that. Um, at least, you know, I, this is like, this was my first trip there. And it would be great to spend some time with some, some park rangers and say, what do you know about the archeology span here? Because I mean, those are good questions about what, you know, where, <laughs> how do you keep water, you know, if, if you had a dry season or wet and, um, it, it just was saying that you probably did not, the water didn't last more than a year. That was what it, what was telling you, you know, that they couldn't store it for more than a year. So no, you should, no to the rivers. <laughs> you should also sort of address the park ranger issue that they weren't there and, this time. Yeah, yeah, they, at, at this very moment, they are not giving guided tours. So you have to kind of do that, this stuff on your own for now. Um, maybe after the first of the year, they'll start the guided tours again. But, you know, it, it's, um, I'd give it a little while unless you really want to rough it out there, um, that it's gonna be, it, it'll be, there'll be more knowledgeable people than me telling you about this if, if you go there in a few months. And um, I, you also had several people that were ancestral, um, tribe members to some of the people that, that, you know, they could trace their, their ancestry back to the Anastasi and, you know, through the Hopi tribe or the Ute tribe, and they were working there. So it's a very, um, you get the sense that the, the, the Native Americans who are living there, working there, are very, very into preserving this from a from a spiritual and religious standpoint, that they, they consider themselves kind of guardians of this place. Okay, here's another follow up from David and Ann. Since they had no horses, did they have any beasts of burden or did they carry everything by manpower? It, it appears they carried everything. Um, they, um, you know, which might have been part of the reason why it was a woman-run society that they made the man carry everything. And um, it's serious, like, you never see any diagram, any petroglyph of a woman climbing up a cliff. It's always these guys, you know? And so um, they, they might have uh, had that figured out early, you know? But um, no, there were no oxen or no, even the buffalo, I don't think buffalo were really, um, they'll probably be very hard to train, you know, and, um, but they, you know, they would come through these areas and stuff. And, and I, I think this, you know, at, during that period of 900, you probably did have buffalo coming through there, but not after it got dry because the buffalo followed the water. So it could be different. Okay. Okay. Um, let's see. It's uh, from Stan and Sandra. Um, Google says the Four Corners Monument is temporarily closed. Is that for renovations or what? No, it's just closed. Um, I, I asked my evergreen host about going there because I was kind of planning on doing it, you know, where you put one hand and one foot in each state, you know, did that sort of thing. And they said, eh, it's closed. Don't, don't bother. So, and it was only an hour from where they live. Um, these were great people I stayed with. I mean, they were just, they knew the area, they were into the geology, they were into the archeology. span I mean, it was just exactly what you want in an evergreen visit, you know, because you're learning about, you're making friends. Um, we just had a great visit all the way around. And, um, you know, I, they're the type of people you want to stay in touch with. I mean, it's just like on a future visits, I would absolutely go and see them again. So, and- right. uh, Last question. Um, how many days were you there? Well, I was only, I, I was only in the park two days. Um, I did uh, three little hikes, um, 
I got from their house. I left early. So I left at seven and was at the park by maybe 830. Um, so from Farmington, New Mexico to Mesa Verde. And then I got there and I kind of picked out a campsite and went on a hike for a couple of miles and then came back and then started going to the sites. And a lot of them, you, you know, you take the binoculars, some of them you go hike down into and see and all. And then at the end of the day, I went up onto the cliffs and hiked up there. There's a, there were trails up there you could hike and hike back down to the campground. And then on Friday morning, um, I went up and hiked a, um, a, a about a, around a 10 mile hike up in there, you know, in the area and, and seeing that. And some of it was just to get a perspective on what would it have been like to live here? You're walking everywhere, you're carrying everything with you, um, you're building these things up the side of a cliff. I mean, it was, these are some tough people. And I mean, you know, you, whatever, you know, our, our, our um, native ancestors that would be from that area, you know, they, they, they had picked this out and they were on a mission. I mean, they were gonna build a city there and, and did. So it was, it was quite, it was just quite a treat for me. And uh, between the, the archeology, span the geology, the astronomy, if you like those things, this would be a place to go. I, I would highly recommend. And again, I went at a good time of year. Going out, you know, I go through the, in the winter there. It's probably really hot in the summer, but I mean, if, you, if there's a way to go in the winter, uh, it's, it would be a really nice place to go and spend time. Okay. okay. Two last questions. One, okay. this is from David and Ann. Um, I've learned that the Anas Anasazi were smart to build <clears throat> on non-agricultural area and save the good ag agricultural land for that purpose. While today we want to have our houses near water sources, so we cover our best agricultural land with our houses. Do you find that to be true? You know th that is a that is a good archaeology question. What are we doing now that we would regret later? And this was this was a you know like you could say well this was smart. They didn't waste anything. They were protected. They had, they could go and get water, but they weren't, you know, they weren't messing up their water source, you know, to do it. Um, I know here in Dallas, the suburbs that were built out where it used to be cattle pastures, you know, range and, you know, cattle land out there, they built houses as far as the eye could see. And that's got to be bad in terms of replenishing the water supply going into the earth. So, um, you know, these are these are the types of questions you ask yourself, you know, in archaeology. I started this presentation by saying, you know, all you needed was a hat and hat and a mystery, and you know that's really what you go out to try to solve, or at least come to some conclusions about. And and I felt like it was it was a great trip where I felt like after learning about the Anastasi and learning about the climate change that had occurred, that. Yeah, they made the right decision by populating New Mexico, Arizona, and Texas, uh, which, you know, maybe if they hadn't had that drought, they wouldn't have done. So, uh, so I have one last question, and then we want to move to the other program. But um, do they know where the Anastasi came from before Mesa Verde? You know, the, the, there's an area in New Mexico over on this edge, about the edge of that M there that is called Clovis, New Mexico, Clovis. And um, in it, the, um, they found um, evidence of hunters there about the year 11,500 years ago, or whatever that would be, you know, uh, 9,500 9, BC. And, um, and that is now out in the desert, out in the middle of the driest place in, in, in America. And yet it used to be a spring there. And what they were finding was elephant carcasses where the bones of elephants that the hunters had slain and you know, where they were using that as their headquarters. It was a spring. And you see that the change that has occurred. They think that people came to 
the northern um, North America about 12,500 um, years ago. And you could tell, again, you know, people have been over in Asia for many, many years before that. There's also some evidence of people coming over across the Pacific to South America and coming up. But, um, you know, the Anastasi would have, would have been not that new. I mean, there would have been many, many tribes before them. And yet Anastasi translates to the ancient ones. And you know, they just don't know about the ones before them. So uh, I know Kath Kathleen and I have camped at a place called Rio Frio in, in Texas, where the owners said that had been occupied for, you know, they think several hundred years. And it's just a spring fed cold river. But it also is a place that probably the buffalo migrated through. So I don't know where the Anastasi came from, but I know where they went. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, thank you, Jack. That was wonderful. Um, so if you want to go